of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and detailed the spread of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. His intention was to give Theophilus certainty that the things he had been taught were indeed true and trustworthy. Now, I'm just going to give a brief synopsis of Acts, or uh, I'm going to at least try to make it brief, because it's 28 chapters over the course of 40 years. One of the last things we read in the Gospel is the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But one of the very first things we read in Acts is Jesus telling them to wait after he just told them to go. He tells them to wait until his father sends the gift that he has promised. Did Jesus pin the term hurry up and wait? The gift that he promised was the Holy Spirit and the power that came along with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1.8 we read, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The disciples do as Jesus told them to, and they wait. They wait for ten days, praying unceasingly the whole time. Then came the day of Pentecost. The festival celebrated on the fiftieth day after Passover. Since it was Pentecost, all of the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a great wind which filled the house where they were sitting. <laughs> then something like tongues of fire appeared and set only in each one of them. And the tongues of fire are significant. It's a repeated Old Testament theme. When God's presence showed up similarly at Mount Sinai, he made a covenant with Israel and gave them the Ten Commandments. Then later, when God's glory came in a pillar of fire, it filled the tabernacle where he came to live among them. The tongues of fire seen over the heads of the apostles is symbolic to God's personal temple presence. It has now come to take up residence in the new temple that is his people. We literally became little mobile temples where God now dwells. Everyone who was there began speaking in other languages. The very first time the gospel is preached, it is preached in the same way, at the same time, in the same place to all people. It was preached in all languages simultaneously. God undid what he did at the Tower of Babel when he brought confusion to all the people. He sent his Holy Spirit to bring clarity and unity. Acts 2-7-11 through, 7, 2, 7 through 11 reads, They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. And why is that significant? Muslims, for example, say that the Quran cannot be translated because for Muslims, God only speaks Arabic. Thus, you cannot truly read his word unless you speak Arabic. Yes, we have English translations of the Quran, but these are considered to be paraphrases. The only true way to read the word of God is to learn Arabic. When Islam comes into an area, it will replace all other culture in that area with its own. The gospel is not preached in this way. The gospel does not replace the culture as other religions do. The gospel redeems the culture. The gospel doesn't suppress the culture. It exalts and lifts out the true meaning of the culture. The gospel is preached to all people of all different colors, or cultures and their own language, all at the same time, showing that Jesus' message was not just for a certain group of people that were more deserving of the scripture than another. It also showed that the divide between God and non-Jews no longer existed. Any person of any culture could now have a relationship with God. No other religions do this. The only religion that does not suppress culture is Christianity. Yes, Christianity purifies culture, but at the same time, it exalts it and makes it something that it exalts it as something that God created to bring him glory. <coughs> Continuing on to verse 13, we read that some of the people in the crowd said they weren't really speaking other languages. They were just drunk and babbling. This causes Peter to step forward, and when he steps forward, he starts preaching. Peter gets up to preach, and 3,000 people are converted. 3,000 people coming to faith in Jesus this day is significant also. Remember when God came to the Israelites and gave them the law at Mount Sinai? 3,000 people died because they could not keep the law. When, 3, 000, when Peter preaches this sermon at Pentecost, 3,000 people came alive because Jesus had already died in their place. 
Later we see Peter and John go to the temple. As they approached the temple, a man who was lame from birth asked Peter and John for money. Instead, Peter makes him walk for the first time in his life. When people realize that he was walking, they rush to see what's going on. Peter sees an opportunity and starts preaching again. Sounds like dad, doesn't it? But this time they're confronted by the priest. Peter and John were imprisoned by the Sanhedrin for preaching about Jesus. They didn't necessarily care that they were preaching or even that they were performing miracles. They only cared that they were doing so in the name of Jesus. The Sanhedrin commands Peter and John not to speak in Jesus' name again, but they reply, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. The Sanhedrin threatens them further and sends them on their way. This becomes an ongoing theme throughout the book of Acts. The apostles preach, they get arrested, they get threatened or beaten, then get released again because they really aren't doing anything wrong. Another time we see the apostles get arrested and an angel lets them out and tells them to go preach in the temple. The high priest sends for the apostles to be brought to the council only to be told that they aren't there, even though the jail was guarded all night. They then hear that the apostles are preaching in the temple. They then arrest them again this time, the high council decided to kill the apostles, but one of the council members warns them against this. He says that if they do, they may find that they are fighting against God. So he advises them to leave the apostles alone, and the high council agrees. But they decided to flog them before letting them leave, you know, just for good measure. Later in Acts, we see seven men chosen to be in charge of food distribution among the believers, since they have sold everything are now living, and are now living in common. Among these men, we see Stephen and Philip. Acts 6, 8 through 15 reads, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, We heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This aroused the people, the elders, and the teachers of religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. The lying witnesses said, This man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs handed, Moses handed down to us. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. Stephen addresses the high council. Enraged by his accusations, they begin to act like children, throwing a temper tantrum. They cover their ears and start shouting so they can no longer hear Stephen. They then drag him out of the city and stone him. Stephen then says the most selfless thing a mortal man has ever said or will ever say. As he is about to be murdered, he kneels down and cries out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. This is where we're introduced to Saul. Saul is one of the witnesses to Stephen's murder, and he completely agreed with it. After the murder of Stephen, the Jewish leaders start a wave of persecution, which, is, which had an adverse effect. It causes the apostles to scatter, by which is the means Jesus' people are sent out into Judea and Samaria. In the first seven chapters of Acts, we see the apostles fulfilling the first part of Jesus' command in Acts 1.8. They have told the people of Jerusalem about Jesus. Now it is time for them to witness throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 28, 26 to 39 brings us back to Philip. An angel appears to him and tells him to go south. He meets the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the queen of Ethiopia. He was obviously a devout follower of God. He had traveled from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship God and was now returning home. He traveled roughly 1,600 miles just so he could worship God in Jerusalem. He was reading from Isaiah, where it says, He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Philip asks him if he understands what he is reading, and he tells Philip that he doesn't. Philip starts riding with him in his carriage, and he explains the scripture to him. He takes the opportunity to tell him the good news about Jesus. As they were riding along, they came upon some water. The eunuch jumps up and says, Look, water, baptize me. As soon as Philip had finished baptizing him, he was snatched away by the Spirit of the Lord and taken to another city. The eunuch then took the gospel back to Ethiopia, where it was able to spread throughout Africa. 
Historians can trace back to this time and see this is when Christianity first came to Ethiopia and it has never stopped spreading since. It's a small section in the Bible that almost seems random, but it has a huge effect on the rest of the world. Next we go to Saul. He's traveling along the road to Damascus, uttering threats with every breath and eager to kill the Lord's followers. <coughs> Jesus comes to Saul in a blinding light and asks why he's persecuting him. Jesus then commands him to go into the city and wait until he is told what to do. Thank you. Blinded by the light, Saul has, been, has to be led by his companions into the city, where he waits three days until a hesitant Ananias comes to heal, the Saul, heal Saul of his blindness. We then jump back to Peter, who is currently in Lydda. He heals An Aeneas of his paralysis, because of, and because of that, the whole population of Lydda and Sharon turned to the Lord. People from the nearby town of Joppa heard about this and sent for Peter to come, as a devout believer in their tame town named Tabitha had just died. Peter comes to the house where the deceased Tabitha is. He tells her to get up, and guess what she does? She gets up. News spread of her resurrection, and many people in Joppa believed in the Lord. Peter is once again in prison. This time they up his guard. Peter is chained with two chains and placed between two guards. That night an angel comes to Peter as he is sleeping and smacks him to wake him up. The angel tells him to get up and the chains fall off. The angel then leads him out of the jail past all of the guards. Even Peter thought he was having, just having a vision. He didn't realize it was really happening until the angel had led him all the way out of the jail. Saul and Barnabas are then commissioned for their first missionary journey. In Acts 13.9, we see the first time Saul is referred to as Paul. There's a common misconception that Jesus became Paul when, or that Saul became Paul when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, which is untrue. Jesus only referred to Saul as Saul, and the Bible continues to refer to him as Saul for the next four chapters. Even the Holy Spirit refers to him as Saul as they are being commissioned. Appoint Barnabas and Saul, Acts 13.13 13 says, appoint, Saul, appoint Barnabas and Saul, for the special work to which I have called them. The subtle shift from Paul, Saul to Paul occurs in Acts 13.13. 13. Now Paul and his companion set sail. The person who changes his name is not Jesus, but Luke. As it turns out, Saul, derived from the famous king of Israel, from the tribe of Benjamin, to which Saul slash Paul himself belonged, is simply the Hebrew name for this person. Paul, a normal, I don't know what word I wrote there, a normal name is his Greek name, derived from the Latin surname Paulus, for someone born in Tarsus, but educated under Gam Gamil in Jerusalem, in a strict form of Phariseeism, this is not unusual. Paul later travels to Macedonia. There they encounter a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled, to enabled her to tell the future. Her masters used her powers for their financial gain. She taunted Paul day after day until he was exasperated and cast the demon out of her. Her masters became angry since they, could no, since they would no longer be able to make money off of her. So they dragged Paul before the authorities and they were thrown in jail. Around midnight, Paul was singing, pray, singing praying, and singing, okay, praying and singing to God and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison doors flew open. The jailer wakes up to see all the prison doors are open and assumes that the prisoners have all escaped. Knowing the punishment that would face him if the prisoners escaped during his watch, he decides to kill himself. Paul stops him. Seeing this, the jailer falls to the floor and asks what he must do to be saved. Paul tells him, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. The jailer and all of his family come to saving faith in Jesus and are baptized. If you ever think Dad's talks for too long, or feel like you might fall asleep because of how long the sermon is, just remember, one night Paul was preaching in the upper room of a three-story building. He preached well into the night, and a young man named Eutychus fell asleep while sitting in the window. He fell out of the window to his death. Paul stopped preaching long enough just to go down where Eutychus lay dead, picked him up, and they went back upstairs together. Paul then continued to preach until dawn. So, yeah, that's not that long. <laughs> final, Paul's final missionary journey ends in Jerusalem. He gets attacked by Jewish people, which attracts the attention of Roman soldiers, 
who think he is a terrorist from Egypt trying to start a rebellion. So he gets arrested. From here, Paul is put on trial, first before the Jewish leaders of the Sanhedrin and Jerusalem. This causes a great uproar. Or, or, while before the Sanhedrin, Paul plays the Pharisees against the Sadducees. This causes a great uproar. The soldiers ended up having to rescue Paul because they feared he would be torn apart. The next day, a group of Jews decided to kill Paul, but Paul's nephew heard about the plan and the Roman soldiers and told the Roman soldiers. This caused the Roman soldiers to transfer Paul to Governor Felix because Paul was a Roman citizen. Felix listens to the accusations against Paul and convenes privately with him. Paul tells Felix and his wife all about his faith and the coming day of judgment. Felix became frightened by the things Paul was telling him and sent him away. Felix ends up keeping Paul in prison for two years. During this whole time, he meets with Paul and talks to him. Felix and his wife may have even become followers of Jesus, but it's unclear. Finally, after two years passed, Felix is replaced by Festus as governor. Only three days had passed when the, leader, when the leading priest showed up to try to get Festus to do something about Paul. Festus tried to drag Paul along, just as Felix did, and apparently Paul had had enough. He appeals to Caesar. Because Festus had no idea how to charge Paul, and it would look silly to send Paul to Caesar without charges against him, he, fought, he allows King Agrippa II to listen to Paul's plea. So what does Paul do? He starts preaching to Agrippa and Festus again. After a while, Festus shouts, Paul, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. And after this week, I've kind of felt like that too. But Agrippa knew that what Paul was trying to do. He knew that Paul saw an opportunity to preach, and then he took it. He stops Paul and says, Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? Paul replies, Whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am, except for these chains. At this, the whole assembly stands up and walks out. As they are leaving, Agrippa turns to Felix and says, Paul hasn't done anything wrong. He doesn't, even, he doesn't deserve death. He doesn't even deserve to be in prison. I would have set him free if the Morhound hadn't appealed to Caesar. After this, Paul was transferred to Italy to stand, before, to stand trial before Caesar. But they try to travel late in the year and face terrible weather. They're ultimately shipwrecked on the island of Malta. The entire scene in which they're shipwrecked is documented in such detail. It's awesome. While on Malta, Paul is bitten by a venomous snake. While it is still hanging from his arm, they start speculating that he must be a murderer and this is his due justice. The storm didn't kill him, but the snake will. Then he shakes the snake off. How long was it hanging on him before he finally shook it off that they had time to say all of that? They waited for him to swell up or suddenly die. But when he didn't, they decided that he must be a god. The chief official of the island of Malta welcomes Paul into his home. The chief's father happened to be ill, and Paul healed him. After healing this, all other sick people on the island came and were healed. All of them. After three months, they traveled on to Rome. Once in Rome, Paul starts preaching again while still under Roman guard. The book ends with, for the next two years... Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. So much happens in Acts that it would take weeks worth of sermons to talk about. That's why I narrowed it down just to these few points, and there was still a lot. Have you ever wondered why God chose this particular time to send his son into the world to die for our sins? Why would he choose to send him during the middle of the Roman Empire? Surely there is a better time than during the Roman Empire, but maybe not. The Roman Empire started in 27 BC and continued until 180 AD. The superpower that was the Roman Empire brought peace to most of the world since it wrote, ruled most of the known world, or at least had political ties to it. Ethiopia was an ally to Rome. If it was not for this alliance, with, if it was not for this alliance the Ethiopian eunuch would not have been in Jerusalem and would not have been able to take the gospel back to his people. The Roman Empire also invested in infrastructure like roads and shipping lanes which sped missionaries on their journey. Rome had also established Greek as the universal language throughout all of the Roman Empire, which allowed the apostles to communicate with most anyone they encountered. Even the association early Christians had with Judaism 
was a benefit. Since Judaism was officially recognized religion by the Roman government, God used all of these political factors to help his church spread rapidly. Even though the Roman Empire had a lot to offer the blossoming Christian movement, a lot of bad came along with it also, namely its leaders. The Roman Empire brought along some of the most well-known crazy people in history. The first, <laughs> the first um, emperor that was there during Jesus' public ministry and crucifixion was Tiberius Caesar. According to, Christian according to the Christian historian, Eusebius Pamphilius, Tiberius actually had a sp soft spot for Jesus since he heard of Jesus teaching to obey Caesar and to render, him, and to render unto him what belonged to him. This historian also said that Tiberius wanted to deify Jesus in the Roman pantheon, but the Senate refused. Even though the Senate refused to deify Jesus, Tiberius still insisted that Christians not be persecuted, which enabled Christianity to grow quickly in its first few years when it could have most easily been suppressed. After Tiberius, we see Caligula, one of the most crazy people in history. He reigned for th from 37 AD to 41 AD, only four years. Tiberius killed Caligula's father. He imprisoned his mother and brothers for treason and then adopted Tiberius and kept him as a well-kept prisoner. The first few months of his reign went well, of Caligula's reign went well, he put into motion the con construction of the great Roman aqueducts. However, just a few months into his reign, he became gravely ill. Although this sickness did not kill him, it did change his personality gravely. From that point forward, he is seen as a lunatic and a monster. He tormented high-ranking senators by making them run for miles in front of his chariot. Around, that same time, around the time that Peter healed Aeneas and brought Tabitha back, from the, back to life, Caligula marched his, to the English Channel to invade Britain. Once he got to the English Channel, he orders his, troop to collect, his troops to collect seashells. He then later said that the seashells were his spoils from when he conquered the ocean. Caligula built a house with a marble stable and an ivory manger for his favorite horse and had plans to make him a senator. Sadly, he was assassinated before he was able to make his horse senator. Caligula thought he was a god, he ordered for a statue of himself to be erected in the Jewish temple at Jerusalem, but Herod Agrippa persuaded him to rethink his decision. After Caligula was stabbed to death, his biographer wrote, he learned by actual experiences that he was not a god. After that, we come to Claudius Caesar, and not much happens for the Christians under Claudius, but he does expel the Jews from Rome since they rioted constantly and were instigators, and expelling the Jews also meant that many of the Christians were expelled. since Christians were viewed as a sect of Judaism. But that was mainly just to keep the peace. It wasn't about persecution. Also during Claudius' reign, there was a great famine that affected the entire Roman Empire. We read about it in Acts chapter 11. It isn't, much further, isn't mentioned much further than that in the Bible because the queen of Adiabene, who had recently become a follower of Jesus, stepped in and helped, sending ships to retrieve food from the other parts of the world which they were then later able to distribute to other people and help other people come to the Jesus. Then after that, we see Nero. From 50, he reigned for, from 54 to 68 and was the, most, the last and most notorious emperor of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Nero's father died when he was two. His mother married Emperor Claudius, and he adopted Nero. Nero then kills his stepbrother to ensure that he would be emperor. His mother also schemed and murdered others to make sure that her son would be emperor. She even poisoned her husband Claudius to make Nero emperor even quicker. Nero became the, the youngest emperor at 16. Once Nero became emperor, his mother tried to control the kingdom through him, so he had her killed also. Nero was the Caesar to whom Paul appealed for justice during his trial in Caesarea. We see that he wins his appeal as he writes about it in some of the letters. Ten years into Nero's reign, there's a great fire in Rome, which burns two-thirds of the whole city. The Roman, citizen, the Roman citizens believe Nero started the fire to clear land for an expanded palace. There were even rumors that he played the violin while watching the city burn, but there is no actual, factual evidence to back that up. Nero, known for his cruelty and love of theater, scapegoated the Christians for the disaster. As a punishment, Nero devised a grotesque executions for the Christians. 
He covered them in animal skins and had them torn apart by dogs. He doused them in tire and used them in tar and used them as living torches to light the night sky for his dinner parties. Nero's use of Christians as human torches to light his evening parties, evening guarding parties is well documented. But this persecution doesn't stop the apostles from spreading their message. Approximately 14 of the 27 New Testament books were written during Nero's reign. Nero executed Peter in 64 AD, and then four years later he caught Paul and executed him as well. Then later that same year, the Roman Senate ran out of patience and declared Nero a public enemy. Nero then fled, and on June 9, 68 AD, at the age of 30, he committed suicide. What's funny is that none of this is written anywhere in the Bible. People were being burned alive to light the streets, and it isn't written in the Bible anywhere, because they knew it was all for a greater purpose, and they were willing to die for that purpose, just as Jesus died for them. They faced all of these things and overcame them. We have it so easy as Christians today, so why don't we do more? If Jesus would have come now, and Christianity started now, would it be able to flourish? If the apostles put the amount of effort into growing the church as we do to simply maintain it, would it still exist today? I'd like to close today with a quote from Spurgeon. If Jesus is precious to you, you will not be able to keep your good news to yourself. You will be whispering into your child's ear. You will be telling it to your husband. You will be earnestly imparting it to your friend. Without the charms of eloquence, you will be more than eloquent. Your heart will speak and your eyes will flash as you talk of his sweet love. Every question here is either a missionary or an imposter. You either try to spread abroad the kingdom of Christ, or else you do not love him at all. It cannot be that there is a high appreciation of Jesus and a totally silent tongue about him. If you really know Christ, you are like one that has found honey. You will call others to taste of its sweetness. You are like the beggar who has discovered an endless supply of food. You must go tell the hungry crowd that you have found Jesus, and you are anxious that they should find him too. Your turn, Debbie.